we're, we're going to fly you from Switzerland over to France. So easy now these days, right? <laughs> no passports required. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so and it's the fastest way to travel. <laughs> Speed of click. <laughs> so uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce Ellen Moore, who is broadcasting from France, from Paris. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of Farm BD, and today she's going to discuss what's new in Europe with a spotlight on France. So, Ellen, if you could please tell us a little bit about your background in the cannabis industry, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me tonight. Well, for me, it's the night, so sorry, today. <laughs> uh, my name is Hélène Moore, and I'm uh, the CEO of FarmBD. It's a, it's a small boutique-style um, consultation firm based in Paris that I founded in 2017. And what we do is that we help our clients to, to uh, reach their corporate development goals and through uh, partnership establishment. Um, and so how... Does that uh, translate into cannabis world? Well, my career started uh, in big pharma. So most of my career, I did uh, work in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, carrying the bag in the 90s. Um, and, uh, I'm a biochemist by training. I started to, to work in pharma and uh, occupied many sorts of position in big pharma in Canada. So I'm French Canadian. Um, and um, uh, slowly but surely, my career evolved in such a way that I ended up doing business development, M&As, uh, licensing deals. And uh, moving to Paris in 2017, I've decided to jump into entrepreneurship and started my business. And this is when I actually had a first client, a Canadian LP, licensed producer, that approached me asking, Hélène, can you help me maybe finding uh, partners in Europe? Because now you're going to be in France. And I said, absolutely, I can do that. And uh, we started to work together. And uh, this, uh, you know, just uh, brought me forward into uh, the cannabis world, working with many uh, clients. And uh, I have been acting as the uh, managing director for Aurora Cannabis in France uh, since uh, 2019, but involved since 2017 in cannabis. Um, so that's my background. And really, uh, my focus is uh, corporate development and strategic partnership development for cannabis firms. Um, so that's basically uh, me in a nutshell and how I ended up uh, working in pharma, in, in, in pharma cannabis, really. Uh, thank you for sharing, Ellen. Um, I'm excited to also have a conversation with you as well about um, what's happening in France, and especially with a little bit of a, of a look over at Europe. Um, and so, in fact, I was hoping that we could kind of start there. What's new and notable with France? And could you give us, you know, a bit of an overview of, you know, what's on right now in France and what's happening? Well, right now, France is going through a, a process uh, of uh, tendering, if you want to call it that way, uh, where uh, France has uh, established a special committee with their health authorities back in 2018 to assess the pertinence and how can we actually give access to French patients medical cannabis. Uh, and uh, they made a decision to um, establish a pilot program. And this pilot program uh, was announced a while ago, uh, but because of COVID, uh, it took a while for the French authorities to release the tender document for manufacturers to apply to the tender. So as, as we talk right now, this happened. So the tender document has been issued uh, mid-October and manufacturers have uh, one month basically to answer that document and propose their products to the French patients through the French government, of course. So this is, uh, I guess, the hot topic in France because right now uh, the, the companies are involved in that, I'm sure, are working head over heels to answer that very stringent cahier des charges that they call in France. It is a more of a pharma style type of uh, tender, and uh, it requests it's requiring a lot of um, a lot of work for the manufacturers involved for sure. Yeah. Wow. And with one 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 with one month to respond, does that does everybody know that this is coming and they're just ready to hit send on this, or is this going to leave some people scrambling? Do you think? 
Well, I think that the parties that were uh, interested to participate into this, this uh, pilot already were monitoring uh, very closely what's happening in France. So I don't think they missed one day uh, if they were interested. Now, if you think about, mo uh, very, there's a lot of companies of course, France is a big country, right? We have a lot of people here, 68 million uh, people in France. It's a big country. Uh, and a lot of companies were just monitoring what's happening without having uh, someone on the ground. And, you know, Fleta said it really well. If you want to understand a market and you want to penetrate a market, you need to have feet on the ground a little, at minimum a little bit, right? And yeah. so I think that the companies that just waited on the sidelines, waiting to see the standard coming out, it would be hard for any of these guys to really say, okay, let's apply on this because the conditions are, are strict, but also what one thing that makes it very different from anything else that we've seen before is that the French government is imposing on the LPs, the licensed producers of cannabis to establish a partnership with a French pharma distributor. So this okay. is not you do. This is not something you can do. Turn around and have a deal with one within one month. Uh, if you haven't uh, shook hand in France before, if you don't know how it works, what's the ecosystem? It would be really difficult for a company to just come in and say, "Let's let's shoot for this." Uh, so I think that's a little bit of a barrier to entry, but uh, it also actually uh, projects a little bit where we're going. And I think Flita said. You know, you explained it very well, Frita, where the partnership component of how to open markets in the cannabis business will be important. And now you see that actually one government, one government is imposing it on the industry to figure out how to partner locally to open the market. So it's very interesting the way they do it. Yes. Um, it, is, is that a model that um, other European countries have followed or is this kind of new and unique to, to France? Are they really um, spearheading it, spearheading this, this kind of model? Well, other European countries, like France is the last one, is, is the new newcomer on the European landscape, if you can say. So will this uh, open a new trend? I don't know. And it's also the one of the last big ones that are really putting something together. Germany doesn't have this imposition, like the ecosystem organically took form with some wholesalers, with some distributors that actually entrepreneurs that created their business to respond to the need of the medical cannabis business in Germany. In France, what the government is saying is that let's, take, let's use what's already there. Let's use our French entrepreneurs to be part of this adventure. Will this be a trend? Maybe if it goes well, let's see. Mm hmm. Yeah, I've, everybody will be watching quite a lot. Um, I know that we've spoken a little bit about pricing, and I'm wondering if that's one of the, the challenges that you see moving forward. Could you tell us a little bit about France's approach to pricing and how that's how that could go? Yeah, uh, so that's a very interesting point. First of all, you know, when you look at pricing of cannabis worldwide, uh, it's a patchwork of you know, it's it's a mess, right? Really, because there's no one country that has the same price, and uh, some in some places it's reimbursed, and some places it's not. In Europe, for example, you have a diversity in that sense of market access condition for the patients. So, if you live in Germany, most likely your drug will be reimbursed. But if you live, uh, um, I think in Poland, it's not yet reimbursed. So it's very different from one country to the other. In the in the UK. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. And there's a scrambling right there to open up the market as well. Um, in France, it, like it is known that French patients don't pay for their drugs. Everything is paid by, you know, what the, it's more of a, a little bit of a social approach. Uh, so patients are not expecting to have to pay when they go to the pharmacy to get their medication. For the pilot, what the government has imposed is that the licensed producers and the company that participates into this three, uh, two years pilot give the products for free. So this is aligned with the concept of gratuity for French patients. They won't have to pay their products. What mm -hmm. did happen yet is to actually elaborate a mechanic of reimbursement and pricing and reimbursement uh, for the, the product, product producers and 
the government. So that discussion didn't happen yet. And it not I happened think, yet. No, it didn't happen yet. And I think that we will need to, to see what will happen because if the pilot lasts two years on grad, like free products, uh, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to establish pricing and reimbursement in France between these two years so that when the generalization happens, if it does, then we, are, we have clarity on the mechanics for payments and how much money will you know, manufacturers be able to make if they want to commercialize their products in France. Right. Preparing for that hopeful transition, you need to have a lot of information, a lot of data already aware so that you can make those projections for once once it's no longer a pilot program, but hopefully real. I mean, there's some there's definitely some risks involved with that, I would say. There is. Yes. And, and um, having worked in, in the pharmaceutical industry, I can tell you that the French market access system reimbursement is one of the most complex in the world. Uh, there are so many variables that goes into understanding why or why not a drug would be reimbursed in France. Uh, so much pharmacoeconomics that goes behind every, every single decision. Uh, that uh, it will be interesting to see how this translates into medical cannabis that has a different status. It's not like a, a drug with a marketing authorization, just like Epidiolex is. What they're trying to see right now is to have medical cannabis full spectrum products as an entity itself. But it's going to be interesting to see how the mechanics for market access will, will be uh, in, you know, taking form. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of, you know, for lack of a better term, bureaucratic red tape going on there. There's just a lot to understand if a company is wanting to enter enter France, um, which really makes me think about something that we were discussing earlier with Flita too, the importance of having partnerships. And you touched on this with um, wanting to understand uh, come, how important it is for a company to really clearly understand the market that they're in entering into. Um, so do you think you could share your thoughts on, you know, the importance of partnerships and how do, how a company should align what they should be looking for with a partner? Yeah, uh, so I think that uh, partner partnership establishment is pivotal. And, uh, and you know, uh, I think that the big vertically integrated companies, sexy, huge companies, uh, it's hard to it's hard to manage, and the, the new business model will be a little bit more flexible. Agility will be important, and and in order to do so, you need to establish strategic partnerships. Think about two years ago, the cannabis industry was all about buying out other companies that will fulfill that need. It's there's nothing easier than buy someone because then you can make them do whatever you want. Strategic partnership is much harder. You don't buy the other party. You have to work with them. You have to actually establish a contractual agreement that covers everything. You have to have governance. You have to have nurturing a relationship with a foreign entity. It's a lot of work. And Fita, you touched on it. And I think you are bang on. But I think that the companies that will be able to do that well will actually emerge, emerge like big time. So this is to me like one of the most important thing that the cannabis industry has to learn is to establish um, fruitful partnerships and see what the other companies can do that they cannot do and what can they bring to a partner in order to actually get the value of this deal up. So there, there's a lot to be learned and to be done yet still. Uh, there's lots of potential. It's actually so exciting um, that you know now we're seeing a little bit more of that. That's that kind of dialogue happening, and it will be uh, changing the, the the face of the industry. I think. Uh, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see uh, how that could happen. Um, I mean, this does this does bring to mind um, the you touched on the agility uh, that businesses will need to have, uh, which is something that so many of us have experienced in this past year because of the pandemic. Uh, what, what have you seen, you know, have you had experiences related to that of just like how the, how the pandemic has impacted businesses and their structure uh, yeah. and how they've had to adapt? 
Um, so my take is more like being in France and in Europe. And so my observation for what happened during the COVID time is that, of course, there's some competition in the heads of the regulators and legislators. There's some competition for headspace. And uh, when COVID hits, uh, the headspace was occupied by COVID and the cannabis part was very, became very small. And that's why like people couldn't spend time thinking about cannabis when people were dying in the hospitals. And, and this is a reality. And we all had to take a deep breath in the cannabis industry to, to realize this is the reality we have to deal with. It's gonna take longer for what we were working on uh, at the end of 2019 to materialize. For example, in France, this cahier des charges, the tender that they, were, that they published mid-October was due to get out January 2020. So there's, there's been like 10 months delay for the publication of that document. And this, so everything is a little bit delayed. And I think that we're not done with that because we're not done with COVID. Uh, and it, it, we, all, we, all, we know all of us working in life science that there's gonna be another two years of disruption created by COVID. Now, you know, we had the confinement, the economy is, has been like, you know, um, a struggle with that, but now we're gonna get into distribution of the vaccines, uh, logistics related to that. And again, in the headspace of the people we're talking to in the cannabis industry, there's another topic that will emerge and that will take priority. So we need to be able to position ourselves uh, the right way without you know, sounding uh, irrespectful of what's happening and learning how to navigate that new landscape. I think that's a reality we have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> what do you think from, what would your recommendation be from what you've seen for if a company was wanting to get into France in the next few years, keeping in mind that now, as you rightfully pointed out, um, we're looking at another couple of years of disruption due to the pandemic. So when does it become, go from disruption to just, you know, the new way that we're doing things and now we've got to yeah. be maybe more agile? Mm -hmm. Well, so a company that would be interested to come to France and do business here for, for the cannabis. So let's make it clear. I'm talking about medical cannabis. Uh, so right now, I think that there's going to be this window where companies will get into the pilot and will will do this pilot. And during that time, it will be a little bit more quiet in terms of short-term of opportunities for the other companies that decided or not to be part of that pilot. Uh, and so I think that one of the first thing, and we talked, uh, so Flita touched on it, culture is very important. If you want to be part of the friend adventure, you need to find, uh, to find a French speaking uh, associate or someone that can be your ambassador in France. It's a big country. It's culturally different. Uh, it is a complex country to navigate in terms of legislation and regulations. You have to have someone here that helps you understand that, that meets people, that shake hands, that gets to explain to the rest of the company, this is, if we want to be successful, this is what we need to do. So have someone here, but if, if you decide not to be part of the pilot, maybe wait a little bit, right? But it takes long, so it might as well be proactive. So that's for medical cannabis. There's also, also the topic of CBD, um, the, the wellness, uh, well-being products. This is not yet happening in France either, but maybe that this could open up like in a shorter term landscape if ever um, the decisions from the, there's some, some very important legal cases that are being judged uh, soon that might uh, open up the market a little bit for CBD, but we'll mm -hmm. see. But culture is the number one, Jill. That is, is so important, absolutely. And I'm just keeping an eye on time and I think we're about to get into our Q&A segment here. Um, but since you had just brought up CBD, I realized we hadn't talked yet much about the CBD market or the role of hemp in France. Um, could you share with us what you know about um, the role of hemp and CBD in France right now and in the what it might look like in the future? Yeah, so, so just like uh, many countries in Europe, CBD is on, on the same level as THC when it comes to legally being able to, to, to sell it. Now you need a prescription. Europe is a pharma uh, 
uh, business landscape right now. If you want to sell medical cannabis, it's through a prescription. When we talk about the wellness products and OTC or like uh, mass consumer products and CBD, huge opportunity, not yet open. France has a huge uh, experience in, um, in hemp cultivation, industrial hemp cultivation, and they are very interested on developing this market in France because they know that if ever they are able to exploit the flower to actually extract the CBD from the hemp flowers, there's gonna be a huge business that will open up. And I think France can be at the forefront of it in, in Europe. I strongly believe that because there's a know-how here in France of hemp uh, cultivation that is really important and it's a dynamic uh, business ecosystem. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder, I'm wondering also about the role of uh, CBD in consumer products like um, the beauty, beauty and wellness space too. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of put them a little bit in the same category. So mass consumer, CBD-based products, but cosmetics is a little easier to get through here in Europe because people don't put it in their mouth. So you're, <laughs> there's less uh, scrutiny on the cosmetics and there's actually a few companies here in France that are starting to offer some uh, CBD-based or hand-based cosmetics uh, in France, yes. Mm -hmm. You can see it, it's a gray area. There's a lot of entrepreneurship. They're taking a little bit of risk getting products out, uh, but they are taking that risk. It's not yet something that's very clear you can do it. So, Well, it will be interesting to see how those risks can pay off, of course. Yeah, I think we're going to see soon like the, the Louis Vuitton of CBD because in France, what they do well is luxury goods. And I keep believing that we're going to see some type of really high-end uh, brands in the, and on the consumer side, but it's not yet happening. Because yeah. the, the legislation is not open for that. Yes, I can see um, we will be joined later by uh, John Downs, who has his finger on the pulse of what's happening in Asia. And we were talking about what's happening with uh, beauty products coming out of Korea, China. Um, so the, the French might be getting run for their money and coming from there if they don't get on it soon. That's Just right. a guess. <laughs> and and they, are, they know that. That's why they're lobbying to the government let us um, exploit our flowers because uh, France is the second biggest hemp um, grower in Europe. There you yeah. go. There you go. So with that, I wanted to check in with where we are on any of our audience questions. Coming from oh, well, Denise. Oh, fantastic. Akasha. I've got some questions for you today. So the first question I actually have for you is, what do you see as the impact the COVID pandemic will have on business? So, so that's a question we touched on a little bit earlier. So I think that I discussed a little bit what it had previously, but I also talked about the headspace and the legislators and the regulators. And of course, when I talk, I, I'm more focused on Europe, but I think that as long as we don't have this solved worldwide, it's going to be difficult for people like us to sit down with legislators and regu mostly regulators and talk about medical cannabis because they are really busy fixing the COVID situation. They will have priority review on the vaccines, priority review on, on medication to help patients. And so it's hard for them to prioritize medical cannabis. And this is gonna be a challenge for us. We'll need to find strategies on how to get our dossiers on top of the pile, or maybe in the middle at least. But right now it's been at the bottom. It has been at the bottom. And it's hard to you know, uh, keep going on that. Uh, I think that's one of the main aspects. Of course, you know, on the financial side, like the, the, the market is really volatile. Investors are, are really nervous and like election, everything has an impact and the COVID also. So this is a ghost above our head and we don't know how it's gonna turn out. So we really need to stay, I think I would stay prudent and uh, without, uh, before investing mass money in, in, in some track, because right now I think that uh, we need to, to uh, be a little bit more patient and poised as an industry, which is not something we have been showing uh, a lot in the past. You know, cannabis industry is not known to be poised and, uh, you know, <laughs> 
know. So mm-hmm. maybe it's something that we need to learn and, and to just observe a little bit more and do things well without, you know, um, bursting into movements that might um, hurt the business. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have another question for you as well. Uh, should companies be exploring different models for their organizational structures? And I know I you're think kind I, of discussing in this business topic, but do you, are you seeing anything that um, I know in various industries, uh, aside from cannabis, you know, people are, uh, businesses are kind of um, stepping back and, and punting again. What are you, you know, I mean, do you, do you see um, perhaps maybe the cannabis industry uh, like going to a new model? Like we have with Canna World Expo, we've got, we're the first ones out there to create this online expo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's going to be some transformation. And uh, to my opinion, of course, it will relate to specializing yourself. So what we've seen right now in the landscape of medical cannabis or cannabis at all, is that companies are trying to do everything. I'm thinking a little bit about Canadian landscape as well, where you have the big five or big six that uh, started with medical and then the rec opened up, they did rec and now they did 2.0 and now they do vapes and they do everything. They, they grow, they transform, they sell, they have clinics, they have this and that. And I think that the, the transformation that we will see is to have companies that are more specialized into something, put canalize their resources toward a very specific goal and do it so well that they will emerge and they will become leaders. Right now, if we try to shoot too large in cannabis, because cannabis also is developing. So the the landscape is larger and larger by the minute, you cannot do it all. And if if you say that you're doing it all, then people will walk away from you. I've seen a lot of pitches of companies looking for money and you, you look at their deck and you're like, there's no way I'm going to give this person one dollar. Why? <laughs> because they're doing it. They, they're telling me they can not do it all. And this is not possible. So I think that the new structural trends that we will see are more towards specialization, crystal clear goal, and, you know, for path to profitability. Uh, it's it's no longer about, you know, I'm bigger than you and, you know, these like neighbors that are, it's, it's no longer that at all. We know that. So this is understood. But the specialization path, I think, will be also important. Niche mm-hmm. approach. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do have two questions from Dr. Chevalier. So he is saying, hello, um, I'm Dr. Antoine Chevalier, PhD. I would like to know if you see any changes in regulation and allow more access to the French market or the tendency is the opposite, which would be more government control. What are the tendencies and the climate? And then in my very butchered French, he said, merci beaucoup. And then I'll have you answer that one. And then I'll ask the second one that he he put in the chat. Okay, so my understanding is like he's asking me like, are, are, is the French reg- regulation is going toward like more of a relaxation of access for patient? And the, the answer to that is absolutely. Why? Because now the government has put in place this pilot program that will allow patients to access cannabis. Like it, as part of their tender, they're putting in the lot flowers, right? So it is like a huge, huge step into liberalizing medical cannabis for French patient. What is a pity, of course, is that there's only 3,000 patients that will benefit from uh, that experimentation. That pilot is small scale, but thank God for the companies that will participate in giving products for free because they couldn't afford it if they would be uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of patients. So the answer is yes, the government is taking this step to open up the, the, it's really hard though in France because there's this stigma about cannabis that is unheard of. Cannabis is a drug, uh, they fight it, they don't want it on the street and it doesn't work at all, right? You know, France is uh, the top uh, cannabis uh, consumers in Europe. You can find cannabis anywhere here in France. However, it's diabolized. So there's been so many years for patients to wait for that to happen. Now it's finally happening. Patients will, the first patient that will get a prescription, it's going to be in March 2021. It's going to be historic. Mm-hmm. And something, please, uh, doctor. 
I hope I answered your question. If not, you can reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. Tasha, you want to um, ask the last question from Dr. A? Uh, sure. Um, he said we'll, we're, we'll wrap up for for um, for this for our presenter, <laughs> Helene. <laughs> he said, um, so for example, I am doing nano CBD water. I am French and lived in the United States since 2000. I would like to expand in my home country and create, among others, high-end luxury. You said you had made mention earlier about, um, you know, like the Louis Vuitton CBD nano water, yeah. and, um, other nano water products. Um, what would be the most cost-effective strategy? Okay. Um, so, so like this is really a tricky question uh, because yet the market is is like it's embryonic, right? It's, it's not there yet. But my gut feeling would be uh, to partner. We're talking about partnership to partner with an established hemp grower mm -hmm. in France. Don't grow it in the U.S. And you know, also France is protectionist. It's a protectionist uh, country. They like to. They're proud of their culture. They're proud of their products. They do it well. We have to say their wine is fantastic, uh, and they can. They will be able to do fantastic CBD products. And I think that this would be the approach I would take if I would be you in the U.S. Having great ideas, maybe patents, formulation. Talk to some French growers. Thank, you so, Thank much. you so much for taking all the time that you've given us today. I mean, this is very, very informative. I mean, even though, um, you know, we're talking about a completely different country, this is valuable information that can be applied in business in general. So it doesn't matter necessarily even what country you're in, the, you know, knowledge is valuable. Thank you. It was my honor. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to having you on one of our next broadcasts. Appreciate it. So now.